I'm going to preface all of this by saying that um, this whole process is new. Um, that's why you guys are all here. That's why I'm here. It's all new. And, and probably there may be questions that I don't know the answers to. If I don't know them, I'm going to get them. Um, I have talked to Mary Beth about maybe once this is all done, um, posting sort of like an FAQ type of document on the Bar Association's website. Plus, you'll all have my contact information. So to the extent that you may have questions that come up after this um, particular event, you're welcome to email me, call me. Um, email's probably best because I hate the cell phone. Um, <laughs> but uh, other than that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so the first real quick thing I want to talk about is the county's change to the appointed council fee caps and rates. Um, that was one of the documents that was included um, with the meeting invite. And it is um, obviously a, a more complex thing than it used to be because it was not always a table that looks the way that it does now. Um, part of the reason for this is because the, um, the county is basically concerned about the level of reimbursement we get from the uh, state of Ohio on these cases. And although it's currently around seven, between 70 and, and 75%, in the past, it's been as low as 42%. Um, and so the, that's the reason for these graduations in the caps and the rates. So the cap that will start applying December or uh, January 1st of 2021 are the caps that are highlighted in yellow under the 70 to 79% column. And the rate that will apply in and out of court is $60 per hour. Um, and as you can see, the in and out of court rate is now always gonna be the same. Um, the other thing that was included, the other document that was included was um, the fee app process that it's basically an outline of what that process is going to be. Um, at the top of that, though, you'll notice that there is some um, information about being or remaining on the appointed council list. Common Pleas Court General Division is going to be maintaining um, their own appointed council list, and they have a process that's established by local rule that I believe they've published. Um, and so you, you may all be aware of that. So to the extent that you serve as appointed counsel in the general division on felony cases, that is the method by which you become or maintain your status on the appointed counsel list. Um, for everybody else, um, that there's a subcommittee of the Criminal Justice Advisory Board that is basically the committee that goes through those applications as you submit them for all the other courts. So instead of the Bar Association maintaining that process now, I'm gonna do it, but on behalf of that subcommittee to the Criminal Justice Advisory Board. So the process is gonna be real similar for those of you who are appointed counsel. It's not, it, you know, I mean, you're gonna fill out the same kind of, of paperwork on the same schedule with the same kinds of documentation it's just that for any court other than Common Pleas General Division, that information will come to me and then I will convene periodically that committee and we'll get those applications or renewals handled. Um, and then moving on down through that document to the reason that we're all really here today, um, the fee application process. The thing you might have noticed about that document is that there are two different steps to this, all right? Um, since the new caps and rates take effect January 1st, what we need to do basically is close out any applications that you have ongoing as of December 31st, 2020, okay, because those are going to get closed out at the old rate. For a lot of you, what that means is you're going to be submitting basically an interim fee application, which is something that's perfectly permissible under the Ohio Administrative Code and and we certainly don't mind handling them to get you all paid out on um, cases that are pending or cases that may re get closed out between now and December 31st. Um, that will just be occurring at the old rate. Um, so 
the application itself, not changing at all. All right, the information that you accumulate for a fee application doesn't change. Um, and it's still on the same Ohio Public Defender form that it's always been on. Nothing about that changes. All right. Um, what I do need you to do, though, is submit those interim fee applications by February 28th of 2021. I know the cutoff is December 31st, but you have to get them in to my office by February 28th of 2021. Now, that doesn't mean you have to wait until December 31st to file those fee applications. If you've got some that are done, you wanna submit them now, send them on over um, and we'll, we'll get them processed. Um, what is new to this process, at least um, besides you know, the fact that they're coming to my office, is the fact that we now have a database that we are going to be using to track um, track activity, track against the fee caps, so that we can produce reports for the judges when those applications go over to them, so that they know um, what the activity is on the case, how far they are from the top of the fee fee cap, whether or not a you know an extraordinary um, fee application is going to be forthcoming, that kind of thing. Um, so the reason that, you know, those, the fee apps are going to be, that's part of the reason why the fee apps are going to be coming to my office prior to being submitted to the court, um, so that we can input that data, produce those reports, attach them to the fee apps and get them over to the courts for signature. Um, now the caveat to this, obviously, for any of you who are on the capital case list is that absolutely nothing about the way capital case fee applications get processed is going to change. The, except for the caps and the hourly rates, those obviously are changing. Um, and you would be advised to submit an interim application to the court if you have a capital case pending in any of the courts right now um, as of December 31st. But the bottom line is those still have to be filed under seal. That's something that you know I can't and my staff can't have access to by virtue of the fact that they get filed under seal. So um, that particular process will not change. All right. Um, now the other thing that that I'm working on getting handled so that this will all be a little bit more convenient for you guys is. I'm working on getting locking drop boxes installed at the common police court clerk's office, as well as the juvenile court clerk's office. We understand that there are frequently affidavits of indigency attached to those. They may have sensitive information in those affidavits. Not, you know, I doubt most of these folks would want their information available to the general public. Um, hence the reason why the boxes are locking boxes but a member of my staff will retrieve the fee applications from those lock boxes, get them processed, get them over to the court, um, you know, and then that process will, will continue as, as set out here. Um, until though those locking drop boxes have been installed, you just need to get them over to the eighth floor of the Ohio building, which is where my office is. Um, so once we get those applications, we put that data in the database, we take them over to the court, get them signed by the judge. We're gonna bring them back. Um, if there's anything that hasn't been filed that needs to be filed with the clerk's office, it'll get filed with the clerk's office by the member of my staff. Um, but then those applications are gonna to go to the fiscal office for payment. So a lot of what we're doing are steps that the fiscal office used to do, um, but because they're pretty thin on the ground these days, they don't really have enough staff to process these things timely, which I'm, I'm sure <laughs> causes you all concern when it comes to getting your fees paid. Um, so, and just as a note, um, the fiscal office, would like to move all of this to direct deposit. Currently, the hang up, for lack of a better term, is figuring out exactly how 
to let you all know once you get a direct deposit in your account exactly which cases and which fee applications that applies to. So that's obviously not going to be happening soon. Um, at, at best, it might happen by the end of the first quarter of 2021, but we're not even really sure about that because clearly we need to be able to report to you all what cases you're getting paid on. Um, so then moving on down through that um, document to the ongoing process, it's not really going to be all that different from the interim process, except that as of 1-1 of 2021, you're going to start using the new um, fee caps to track your, your uh, cases and then use the new hourly rates. Um, the, those rates, that, that reimbursement percentage that the county gets is based basically on the state's biennium budget, all right? And that is generally adopted by the end of June of every year for a two-year period. Um, and, and so if those rates change between the, the columns on that schedule, it's going to be happening probably usually in July. It's only hopefully going to happen one time a year or actually one time every two years because it's a, it's a two-year budget. Um, the only problem that we'll have is the state has been known to look at their budget and in cases of emergency, for example, you know, pandemics, um, say, oh, hey, we can't actually give this much money to that line item in the budget. We have to take it away. So it's entirely possible um, that they could rob the Ohio Public Defender's Office of whatever portion of the budget it is that they've promised them for two years, which would impact their ability to reimburse us. Um, I will tell you, frankly, it's surprising to me, but Governor DeWine has been disinclined to let them raid this line item of the budget for COVID. He um, expressed a com commitment fairly early on to um, indigent defense. And he has maintained that commitment even in the face of a pandemic, which I find to be fairly admirable. Um, so uh, as is, as was the case with the interim applications, um, or what, as is the case with the applications you get now, obviously we've got a time frame within which we need to get applications processed, get them paid and get them down to the public defender's office so that we can reimburse them. Generally speaking, we are gonna be asking you to submit applications within 60 days of the completion of a case so that we can take um, generally hopefully no more than 10 days or so to get all the documentation firmed up, confirmed with you all in case there's something missing, get it over to the court, get everything signed, get anything filed that needs to be filed and get it back to the fiscal office, um, all within the 90 day time frame that we have to observe. Um, let's see. Um, as I'm sure you've learned from the fiscal office um, over however many years you all may have been doing this, missing information is a problem. So um, for example, um, signatures missing on an affidavit of indigency. If you don't have the client's signature on the affidavit of indigency, you gotta get it signed by the judge, okay? Well, that'll be one of the things that you, you bring to the law department in a form where it's prepared but not yet signed by the judge, we will get the judge to sign that as well as any other um, motions, orders, what, paperwork that is included with that fee application. Um, you just, I, I'll need you to put a cover sheet on that indicates, you know, there's an unsigned affidavit of indigency that requires the judge's signature. Um, that way, my staff member can be attentive to the fact that there are extra signatures that are needed. I don't, you know, I don't want anybody to get um, um, get their fee app hooked up because you know we're missing just that one signature. But I promise you, the fiscal office will be looking for it. Um, oh, let's see. Um, and then just. At the, at the bottom of that document, interim fee applications are permitted. They always have been. 
Um, I know that the, I think the Ninth District Court of Appeals has previously been unwilling to permit interim fee applications. I've talked to Mike Walsh over at the Court of Appeals and most definitely with respect to the closeout of um, 2020 fee applications, they're willing to accept interim fee applications. I think, however, that that is going to be a process that they're gonna be willing to accommodate on an ongoing basis. Um, and then, um, God, I've gone through this really fast. I know um, if any of you all have questions, fire away. I have a question. Okay. Um, the fee schedule that is provided for the mm -hmm. criminal cases, currently there are, the fee schedule is based on whether the case resolves with trial or without trial. Is there a difference for resolution with trial or without trial on the new schedule? No. And I had a second question as well. Mm -hmm. Um, the turnaround time between when we submit our fee applications and when we actually receive the payment, is there an estimate on how long that's going to take? Um, that's a, you know what, that's a good question. And that's one I'm going to have to get an answer from fiscal on. Um, it's, it's my plan though, as soon as we get those to get the applications verified. So like if there's any missing data, we'll get that missing data. Um, that's going to involve reaching out directly to the attorney who submitted the fee app. Um, so long as we can get that information quickly, we'll get it over to the court. I, I would say, as, I mean, this is going to be the sole job of this member of my staff. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's not like she's going to have a whole bunch of other stuff to do. And then maybe once a week, she'll be processing these fee apps. This is going to be an ongoing daily thing. Um, so I would hope that between getting the app together, getting it over to the court, getting the judge's signature, um, you know, getting anything filed that has to be filed, I would think that that process would take no more than 10 days. So then we'll get all of that over to fiscal um, but I'm sure you all have more experience with I do than I do with once fiscal gets it, how quickly it gets paid. Now, of course, they're not going to be doing two thirds of the process anymore because we're taking care of it. So if it was, if it did seem to lag in the past, I'm thinking it will not going forward. And, and I know that doesn't directly answer the question. I'm sorry, but I'll, uh, I'll see what I can't do about getting an estimate. And like I said, we'll include this in a, in a frequently asked questions type document that will get posted to the bar's website. And I had one more as well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. For submitting our fee applications, are we still submitting those to the judges or are we now submitting them to a different office? You're submitting those to my office. And are we, is there a Dropbox or are we emailing them or what process do we use to get them over there? There, there will be a Dropbox. Um, I've already been working with the Director of Administrative Services to get those installed over at Common Pleas Court and Juvenile Court. Um, I, I mean, I like approved the purchase and everything, so I would think that it wouldn't be more than a week before those boxes would appear in the clerk's offices. But I'll make sure that um, I let the folks at the Bar Association know so that they can disseminate information about those boxes actually being installed and available um, on a more wide basis. Um, until then, you need to have somebody drop them off at my office. Now, my office is in the Ohio building up on the eighth floor. So the address is 175 South Main Street, eighth floor. We're right across from the Civic Theater. Um, just bring it on up, drop it off. Um, my assistant is, a, is accumulating them and passing them off to the, to the member of my staff who's doing the processing. I have a follow-up to that question. Sure. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good. How have you been? I've been good. It's been ages. So um, I know that you just said that we need to drop off 
the FIOPS to your office um, at the Ohio building um, uh, until the drop boxes become available at the courthouse. Uh, under the current global pandemic situation, uh, will there be a mechanism by which we can submit those fee apps electronically to your office um, with the proper documentation? You know, I I don't have a problem with that. Um, I, and that's another thing I need to find out. It seems to me that somebody and I think it might be the fiscal office ultimately has to have an original of the application. Um, I know that the public defender's office does not care if they're copies. All right. Um, but I think somebody has to have an original. But let me nail that down. Um, as far as I'm concerned, though, um, I, I would be willing to accept electronic copies. It's just the only problem is if you need the judge to sign the affidavit of indigency and that has to be an original to be filed. I mean, if there are a lot of signatures you need, that that might be the one thing that would cause an emailed application to be problematic. Hey, Dan. Oh, I... Oops. Sorry, I just wanted to um, address a couple of the questions that were submitted by a chat. Um, just to confirm and really, really define this December 1st date, it's my understanding, Deb, and correct me if I'm mistaken, that if a case is closed prior to December 1, then the attorney should use the previous process, which is submitting those fee apps to the judge. It's only the cases that close December 1st and after including the interim billing through the end of the year that go to the law department. Is that accurate? You're muted. <laughs> yes, again. that's generally correct. Um, here's the thing though. I mean, if you're bringing a whole bunch of applications over and some of them are before December 1st and some of them are after December 1st and you want a one-stop shop, I'm happy to take care of all of them. I don't have a problem with that because it might be kind of a pain in the butt getting in and out of all of these different buildings as you're navigating the temperature checks and the masks and you know everybody's different rules. Um, I am perfectly happy to take care of anything that you would submit, even if it's from before December 1st, um, just to get them processed. Okay, so at this point, all fee apps can be submitted to you no matter when the case closed by up until cases closing November 30th of 2020, those may be submitted to the presiding judge. Yes. Okay. Another question was with regards to the um, caps on the fee, specifically for those of us practicing in juvenile court. Um, there's no specific delineation on the schedule that you provided. And it looks as though the cap falls under juvenile other, which is now at $900. Uh, the concern is that that cap is now lower than the, the current existing cap of $1,000. Number one, is that the correct way that we're interpreting this? And number two, because all the other caps were raised, is that something that can be reviewed and perhaps a recommendation for increasing those caps made? Um, I actually got that that exact same question a few days ago from an attorney who practices in juvenile court. Um, and I have reached out to the chief of staff so that we can talk about that. So that's something that is, is going to be reviewed. Okay. Um, one of the other questions presented is about the appointed counsel list. With the um, law department being in charge now of specifically the juvenile court appointment list, what documentation do you need um, from us if we are just renewing our um, place on that list? And is that different than somebody or the information needed to come onto the list? Um, it, I, I believe the information necessary for renewing is 
and it's it's been a while since we had one of these committee meetings. So I, I got to be honest, I haven't um, I haven't done this in a while, for lack of a better term. But it seems to me that on the renewals, the information was far less extensive than it is for a new application um, or an application that gets filed if you're planning on moving up in the list of felonies, for example, that you're willing to handle. Um, and so I need to, I, I need to sit down with um, Alan at, at the Bar Association and um, get a, a more thorough set of policies and procedures put in place. Um, better than the, you know, the simple outline that's there. I know that generally speaking with a renewal, um, if since you last filed your application, your, um, your malpractice insurance might have expired, you'd have to give us a new um, certificate of your mal co malpractice coverage. Um, if you've changed addresses, you know, you just need to make sure that you update us on what your address is, um, updated CLEs. Um, I, that's all I remember even being necessary for a renewal. But then obviously with a new application, it's, it's all of the, you, ha, you know, all your trial time, all of your CLE that's appropriate to the level that you're looking to um, level of felony or that you're looking to represent. Um, I think the, the common police court judges are re still requiring a picture to be submitted or a photo to be submitted. Um, insurance certificate. Um, CLE transcripts, um, the, the completed application. It's it's a lot more documentation for an, uh, somebody who's just coming on new. Okay. And will that be delineated in the Q&A or the frequently asked questions or, you know, however you're going to be posting um, it? That's actually probably going to have to be a separate posting once I have a chance to sit down and talk to Alan and actually go, you know, step by step through the procedures that they followed. Um, okay. So that I can get, you know, have it actually in the form of a good coherent document that, you know, can be posted. Okay, but everyone will be given adequate notice as far as what is needed to be submitted. Yes. Okay. Um, another question. Juvenile fee apps require a copy of our appointment letter when we submit mm -hmm. them. Will that remain the same going forward in 2021? Yes. Okay. And also uh, juvenile um, fee applications, if the financial affidavit is in excess of one year um, from the date that they signed it, we need to submit a new application. Does that remain the same? Um, I'll be honest, that was a rule um, that I wasn't, I wasn't aware of, rather. right, I wasn't aware of that. Um, I think it's, but I, I mean, I suspect it's because court, if I'm not mistaken. And, and mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, let me nail that down. Yeah, in juvenile court, there's a local, I believe it's a local rule, um, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, obviously. Um, as far as where it comes from. But if a financial affidavit is dated in excess of a year ago, then we have to acquire a new financial affidavit or have the judge sign a financial affidavit indicating that the party is unavailable or however we need to submit it. And I, I believe the juvenile court is the only mm -hmm. court that that pertains to. And I know that does present some challenges sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, but let me nail that down for certain. And it would kind of make sense because sometimes those juvenile cases tend to pend a lot longer than, you know, some of your less complicated, at least, um, felony and misdemeanor cases. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's more often than not that they go in excess of one year. Right. Um, I did get a question about right. municipal court. Um, do we submit municipal court appointed misdemeanor fee applications to the eighth floor? Oh, you know, that's kind of a hot potato right now. Um, <laughs> um, I, it, as far as I'm concerned, the answer is yes. But I think if you asked anybody over at municipal court, they would tell you no. Ultimately, however, it's the county that pays them. So 
I say yes. And then if there's any, you know, issue with getting something signed by a municipal court judge, I'll, I'll take that on. <laughs> okay. Um, and it may be the same question or follow up. Do municipal court judges sign separate from the fiscal office process? I'm not quite sure what that means. Okay. That was submitted by Chris Vandeveer. I'm not sure if that question was already answered in the first question or Chris, if you want to unmute yourself and clarify. Yep, just real quick. I was thinking in terms of if, if we took it over, walked it through the, the municipal court, had the judge sign it, maybe clerk it in at the municipal court and then take it to the eighth floor for kind of the, the back end fiscal office process. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, I would say no, Chris. I think that before you ever take it over to Muni Court, it's still got to come up to um, it's got to come up to the eighth floor, and we'll take care of getting it processed through Muni Court. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just it's 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 the money issue, and it's just a question of where you guys need to step in. So thank right. you. Certainly. Okay. Um, this question goes back to the appointment list. At what point do we need to renew our place on the appointment list? Is it something that's gonna be addressed at the beginning of every year or is that to be determined? Um, I, that's a good question because it seems to me that if, if renewals were done annually, there would have been a whole lot more of it going on um, on that committee. Like our, our meetings would have been, you know, almost interminable because the appointed council list is not necessarily a small list. Um, so I'm thinking it might, it might be a period more than one year, but that's something that I'm gonna nail down and put in the procedures that get posted um, to the Bar Association website. They'll all also wind up on the court's website and they'll also wind up on juvenile court's website. Um, I'll speak with the juvenile court folks about doing that and on the county executive's website. So there'll be plenty of places where these will be posted so that you know what it is you have to do. Okay. Um, I'm just going through some of the questions. If anybody um, at this point has any questions that I haven't addressed, if you want to jump in. Yeah, Deb, this is Mark Ludwig. <clears throat> hey, Mark. Hey, um, this is uh, one of my typical silly questions and it may only, only reveal my lack of math skills. But <laughs> as, as I look at the indigent schedule, for example, a felony, uh, felony one says $8,000 in the first column. And that first column seems to imply that, that the reimbursement rate is 100%. Right. Our that column, means, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that 100% is the, assumes we're getting reimbursed by the state at a rate of 100%. Correct. So if we had set a felony first degree at 8,000 with a $75 an hour rate, we would get reimbursed at 100%. But since we've set it at $6,400 at 60, we only get reimbursed up to 80%. I'm, 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 I'm not crunching all the math numbers, but doesn't that sound like we're getting reimbursed less? If we pay out 8,000 and get 100% repaid, uh -huh. But we pay out 6400 and only get 80% repaid. Ain't we getting less money? If you mean, isn't the county getting less money? Yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah. Why, yeah are this we, is why, never... are, why are we shooting ourselves in the foot that way? Well, this is never a winning proposition for the county. Um, but it we, sounds we like are... we lose less at 100% reimbursement. Well, correct. Correct. The, the whole, this whole process started 
because the Ohio Public Defenders Commission looked at the rate schedule and the fee schedules that were in place throughout the state of Ohio, all right? And in some counties, they were satisfied with those schedules. And in some counties, namely Summit County, they were not satisfied with the schedules. And so they reached out to us at the executive's office and said, hey, your schedules for, reimb for paying attorneys, um, hourly rates and caps aren't sufficient. Gave us a bunch of research, gave us a bunch of information on what other counties are doing. Um, and caused us to undertake the analysis that ultimately yielded that graduated fee schedule. All right. Um, if the Public Defenders Commission is reimbursing us at 100%, it, it never really is 100%. And I'll tell you why. Um, one of the reasons is because a lot of times there are applications that get submitted that we don't get reimbursed for because they're beyond the 90 days um, that the Public Defenders Commission deems to be acceptable. Um, sometimes they don't get reimbursed because there were extraordinary fees that the Ohio Public Defenders Commission doesn't wanna reimburse us for. I mean, there are any number of reasons why it, we never really would actually get 100%. Um, but at this point, like I said, the governor committed for a two year period that we were gonna get reimbursed at at least 70%. So. It's still- I have yeah, a follow up. It, 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 it's still, but I, I, I can call you and talk sure. about it. I don't need to eat up people's time. I'm, I'm okay. sorry. No problem. This is Angelina Jingo. I have a follow up to that, I guess. So then can we expect that we won't be as uh, readily reimbursed for extraordinary fee requests? You, if you make an extraordinary fee request and the judge signs the order, we pay the extraordinary fee request. Okay. When I say we don't get reimbursed, I mean Summit County doesn't get reimbursed by the Ohio Public Defenders Commission for the money that we've paid out. So you guys get paid, I mean, unless the judge cuts your you know, your fee app, which I think is probably a fairly rare occurrence. Um, but what's on your app, it gets paid. And if there's an extraordinary fee, you know, motion and, and order, it gets paid. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Deb, but I, I understood. Oh, you just muted yourself, Mark. What was the former reimbursement rate? The reimbursement rate prior to this biennium was, uh, I think it was 42%. It was it was about the lowest that it had ever been. So when uh, I say- that 70. Yes. And you're, you're paying us a 70. We are paying you at the rate that reflects the fact that we are only getting reimbursed 70% of what we pay out. So if we pay out a million bucks, on fee applications, all right, we get 700,000 back from the state of Ohio. And what happens is that money that rolls back in gets rolled right back into this process to be used to pay fee applications. Hey, Dad. So the, yes. I'm sorry. I, I just, I know you're going to, you said you were going to talk to somebody about the $900 fee cap for, for juvenile court. What I, I just wanna add to that when you do, I don't have numbers in front of me obviously, but for those of us that take on the difficult abuse, neglect and dependency cases at 40 and $50 per hour, we are often asking for extraordinary fees. So to pay us $60 an hour and lower our cap, I think it, it's just asking for a whole lot of paperwork and, and extra work. So I wanted to add that to the information when you sit down to, to talk to them about that. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Diane. And, uh, that's that's unclear. You that do, yeah. And yeah. you do want a motion for extraordinary, an order and motion for extraordinary fees if you're over $900 starting January 1st. Yes. Um, 
I had a question with the pandemic uh, and your office being uh, kind of locked down. Um, is it still how easy is it to get V apps up there right now? Um, it it can't be too hard because I've I've got them coming in every day. <laughs> okay, I just I've... um you just you have to walk through the temperature check station now. However, if you were over at the courthouse before you come over to see me, they should be giving you a sticker that says you went through the temperature check there. Okay, I can promise you that if you come to the Ohio building first, you'll get one of those stickers. You know, and it'll it basically just says, you know, COVID-19 and the date, but it's proof that you went through the temperature check station at the Ohio building. Um, so that that should make it a little bit easier if you then go across the street to the courthouse to get through that, because they'll see that you've already been through one temperature check. But you and, can get in pretty easily. I mean, we can get in the building. I, I, yeah. But your office, the door is locked. We gotta if there's nobody there, we gotta call somebody generally, right? Yeah. Yes. I had so who would one... we call? Um there's a there's a phone right by the door and there's okay. a list of numbers. Um quite frankly, it, it, generally if you just knock on the door, <laughs> somebody answers it and half the time it's me. Um, because there really aren't too many people up there. Um, but I happen to be generally, except for right now when I have construction going on in my bathroom, um, I'm there every day. So um, I have been known to just get up and answer and the door. Are we able to mail those fee apps? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, can we mail the fee apps into you? And if so, to whose attention should, should it be directed? I would direct it to my attention. So using the address before okay. 175 South Main Street, um, eighth floor, attention deb mats, you know, Akron, Ohio, 44308. I had one last question about the $900 uh, cap. Mm -hmm. it, it appears in the chart that there's a, a custody section under the domestic relations proceeding. Is that intended to be for the juvenile cases, given that a lot of counties mix those two courts together and we don't because there's no court appointed custody attorneys in domestic court um i want to say that that particular line item under domestic relations court has to do with a change in the statute that frankly, only applied to Summit County um, that put a, a certain type of custody case into the jurisdiction of domestic relations court as opposed to juvenile court. Deb, just to clarify, um, sorry, it's Christina here. I've just started taking those custody cases at the domestic court, and those yeah. are legal custody cases similar to Summit County Juvenile Court, but only when Children's Services is not currently involved. Those were transferred from the Juvenile Court to the Domestic Court. So that's a grandmother seeking custody, let's say because mom is an addict, but Children's Services mm -hmm. is not involved. That's gotcha. where those apply. Right, but traditionally those have not um, been afforded appointed counsel for private legal custody matters. Well, they are now. <laughs> um, Provided the client is indigent. If, if the client is indigent, there's been a couple of hiccups along the way where the grandparents have private counsel, but were awarded, you know, basically a free guardian. And so I think the domestic court is still looking into those sort of situations. Yeah. So I think that's probably something that I need to be nailing down a little bit better. But I appreciate that, Christina. Thank you. Um, I had a question. This is Anthony Costello. Hey, Hi. Hello. You? Very fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, you indicated that uh, if services were done prior to December 1st, that the, I guess my question is, if all the services in the case that's still going on were performed prior to November 30th. 
the the application should still be submitted to the judge yeah yes okay. like i said yeah. if you if you've got a whole bunch that you're bringing in and it happens to include one of those pre-december 1st applications and you don't want to run all over the whole world you can bring them all to me and i'll take care of them okay and um thank you very much and, and the other question i had i guess is um when you in a case after December 1st, if you're asking for extraordinary fees, so you submit the motion in order for extraordinary fees along with the application to your office? Yes. And um, I guess my other question is, um, is uh, I think under the old system or extraordinary fees, at least in criminal cases, were limited to one and a half times the normal fee. Is that still in effect or is that not in effect anymore? Um, it, that, I think that rule, comes from the judges. Oh, okay. So they're the ones who figure out what level of extraordinary fees they're going to sign off on. Um, that's that's not anything that was ever, I don't think, included in our codified ordinance. Okay. My understanding has always been that you you know if you are submitting an extraordinary fee motion and it the order gets signed by the judge, we pay the fee. Oh. Um. Okay, and the last, last question is uh, the applications for attorney fees and uh, domestic contempt cases, those are also submitted to your to your office? Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Sure, no problem. Deborah. Deb, give the, the time frame. It, no. Sorry, give just, just the time frames that we're looking at. Or is your office going to be open during the week between Christmas and New Year's? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Neil. Deb, in a delinquent, yeah, no problem. If you had a delinquency, which is an F1, but then you resolve it as a lower felony or misdemeanor, which cap are you in? I think it's the it's the cap that applies as the case is charged. All right. So even so if, if it F1 gets resolved gets at a lower F5. level. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Neil. What was that? No, if an F1. The cap is uh, juvenile F1 is 4,000, but you'd like resolve it with the as a plea bargain down to an F3. That's $2,800 cap, so it would be under the $4,000 cap. Yes, okay. So, just for clarification, um, we can start providing if, if we think the case is done and we're not doing any more work on it till the first of the year, we could get that interim fee app into you now. You sure can. Thank you. And we'll get those processed. And it's up to us in our discretion whether or not we want to do interim billing, just in general, interim billing or not bill until the end of the year, correct? Um, other than this December 21st. Other than this December 31st cutoff, yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. And I, it doesn't matter if we haven't had a hearing within the last 30 days, we can still submit the fiat by December 31st. You sure can. Okay. The, I'm sorry, I thought you said end of February. The, so the cutoff for the interim apps at the old rate is December 31st. But you have until February 28th to submit them to my office. The, the, P, the PD's office defines juvenile cases differently and submitting after every dispositional hearing or after every hearing is not considered an interim app under the juvenile, under the PD's rules. Just to, it's a little bit, that's why we have been able to do this in juvenile court all along. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's been, right. it's not considered an interim application. Gotcha. Hi, yes, ma'am. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? Doing good. One quick question, just to be clear with the drop box that's going to be in the general division clerk's office. Mm -hmm. Does that encompass ninth district applications as well? Are they going all into one because the clerks are in the same office or do we need to bring ninth district directly to you? Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. I need to use my words. Um, you can drop ninth district applications off in that same box. Great. Thank you. Uh, for um, juvenile we appeal. Only have a couple minutes. Go ahead. Yeah. For juvenile appeals, the cap is 2,000, but if it's a felony, appeals are 4,000. If it's a delinquency appeal, are you under the felony or are you under the juvenile cap? 
Uh, you're under the appellate cap. No, under the appellate cap, there's felony and there's juvenile. If it's a delinquency, which one are you in? Juvenile. Even if it's an F1? Well, wait a minute. Ask the question again. I think I misheard. A delinquent is a delinquent is found delinquent of an F1 and he appeals. Okay. okay. That's a juvenile case, but it's also an F1. Right. Is it the two thousand dollar cap or the four thousand dollar cap? Hmm. That's a good question. I think it's the four thousand dollar cap. Because it doesn't say felony degree one adults only. So the juvenile is only for abuse, dependence, and neglect appeals? The juvenile other? Yes, I believe yes. so. Okay. All right, we only have uh, two or three minutes left. Are there any last questions? I have, I have one if I can interject here. Sorry, sorry, Angeline. Go ahead, Linda. Um, hey, Linda. I just wanted to clarify that it's the judges that will continue to appoint, or will that the appointments be coming out of the law department at random? The judges will continue to do the appointing. Okay, we're just I, providing them with the list of attorneys who you know are qualified for the appointments that they might be making. Okay, and for those of us, and there are probably just a handful. Uh, who are registered with the juvenile court for appointments, but have never signed up for appointments in the other courts. Uh, will that uh, appointment in the juvenile court translate or transfer uh, for all the purposes here today for fee apps? Or do we, staff do we have to reapply or as a new person with your department or? Um, if, I think if you're qualified by juvenile court, you're qualified by juvenile court. Okay. And it, it, the, so unless you want to suddenly start doing okay. misdemeanor work and then ultimately work up to felony work in common pleas court, aside from juvenile court, yeah. then you're going to have to go through the application process. Okay. Now, every year in juvenile court, uh, the attorneys on the appointment list uh, have their credentials uh, reviewed and updated. Does that satisfy the renewal process or do we have to do something more for your office? I believe that satisfies my process. If it's okay. being done by juvenile court, that's fine by me. Good to know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I see on uh, one of these handouts that it shows that properly documented fee apps will be delivered to the appropriate judge no later than 60 days from the date of receipt. Yes. Does it your office never take that long, by the way. <laughs> okay. Okay. That was my I think that that's where you were question. going, right? Yeah. Just what what kind of timeline can we anticipate? Yeah. That and that comes with the, the question where I my answer was I think I need to nail down with the fiscal office how long it takes them to pay a fee app. We're gonna turn those apps around mm -hmm. as we get them. Because like I said, this the person on my staff who's gonna be doing this, this is gonna be their full-time job. So, I mean, I know that there are going to be probably a whole lot of fee apps to process, but she's going to be doing it all day, every day. So she's going to be processing the applications, printing the reports, getting them to court, getting them, getting things filed, getting them back, you know, and, and getting them to fiscal all day, every day. So, you, you know, once your app comes in, it, in theory, should be processed pretty quickly. Thank you. I appreciate I can, that. I can see this December 31st time frame, you know, this end of the year crunch being kind of kind of harsh, but other than that, all all day every day this is going to be churning. Thank you for fielding our questions. Sure. So we are yeah, thank at you. the one o'clock hour. I would just um, wrap this up by thanking Deb very, very much for um, presenting to us today. Obviously, it's a, a, a an important topic near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, I also want to thank the Bar Association for their graciousness in opening this up to um, the entire uh, bar that practices the juvenile court, not just Akron Bar members. So that's greatly appreciated as well. We are recording this, so it will be open and available to those of you who may know somebody who wasn't able to participate. You can contact me 
um, or the Akron Bar, and you know we can have a link available to you. Any other questions can be submitted to Deb Max at the email that was um, made available in the documents. And I thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. Well, I apologize for the short notice, but okay. thanks everyone. Um, real quick, and Michelle, you might not be able to answer this, but you might be able to. Is it possible to get a transcript of the questions from the chat? Because I can use those to do the FAQ. Yes, yes, I saved the chat, so I'll send okay. it to you, Deb. Um, and cool. I'll also post um, the the two um, uh, uh, documents that you provided on our website at akronbar.org um, uh, backslash materials. And we'll, we'll hope to get this um, video up on uh, social media so that it can be shared uh, among the people who weren't able to participate. Thank you okay. so much everybody for participating and um, everybody stay healthy and safe.